Amen. Praise the Lord. That was good. He is our shepherd. And this is not my sermon, but think about this. When, when, when the sheep is lost, who's the one that's actually missing out? You can say the sheep is missing out, but guess who's actually missing something? Shepherd. The shepherd. Can I tell you, you, you might love Jesus, but you can never love him as much as he loves you. Amen. He's the one that's looking for you. When you stray and you wonder, he's the one that's missing. He's the one that's longing. He's the one that's searching. We, we think it's all about how much we love him. Praise the Lord, we do. But you know even why we even know how to love him? Because he first loved us. He is our shepherd. That's what music is supposed to do. Music is supposed to speak to our heart. And teach us and help us. And uh, take your Bibles and turn to John chapter number 9. John in chapter number 9. And uh, we're going to read all the way through uh, this chapter. And uh, uh, kind of the whole thing is connected and there's a story. And to be honest, you could take uh, time and there, probably, there is value in um, parsing through each of these different parts and finding uh, applications to each of the different scenes and uh, uh, each of the different elements that are in the story. Uh, but as we're preaching through the book of John, I'm going to tell you there's a reason that Christ did this here at this time at this point. And uh, I don't want us to miss the message of why Christ did it. We can learn things from all parts of it, but I don't want us to miss the message of why he did it. And uh, so that's what we're going to look at. And so if you'll stand together with me, please, for the reading of God's word. And we'll start in verse number one and read all the way through the chapter. The Bible says, and as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did, who did sin? This man or his parents, that he was born blind. Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Amen. He, when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and anointed the eyes of the man, uh, the blind man with, with the clay and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Shalom, which is interpreted, uh, interpretation sent. And when he went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him, that, uh, that which was blind, said, Is not this he that sat and begged? And some said, This is he. And others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. Therefore said they unto him, How were thou thine eyes open? And he answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay, and anointed my eyes, and said unto me, Go unto the pool of Shalom and wash. And, when I, and I went and washed, and I received sight. Then said they unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. They brought the Pharisees, uh, to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind. And it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. And again, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. And he said unto them, He put clay upon my eyes, and I washed and do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such a miracle? There is such division among them. And they say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him? He that openeth thy eyes, uh, as he said, he, he is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked him, saying, Is this your son? whom ye say was born blind, how doth he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know not that he is our son, and that he was born blind, but we know that he is our son, and that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. For who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age. Ask him, for he shall speak for himself. These words spake his parents, because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed already that if any man did confess that he was the Christ, they should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, said his parents, he is of age, ask him. Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know this man is a sinner. 
He answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, where I was blind, now I see. They said, then said they unto him again, what did he to thee? How did he open thine eyes? And he answered them, I have told you already. Did you not hear? Wherefore should ye hear it again? Will, will ye also be his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, thou art a disciple? We are a disciple of Moses. We are Moses' disciple. We know not that God, we know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. And the man answered and said unto them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing, that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, it was not heard that a man uh, opened his eyes of one that was born blind. Of this man, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, Was thou altogether born in sin, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? They answered and said, Who is he, Lord? that I might believe on him. Jesus answered, Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I come into this world, that they which might not see, uh, and they which might see be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? And Jesus said unto him, if ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, we see, therefore your sin remaineth. Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we look at this portion of Scripture, Lord, that you might give us instruction. You might illuminate to us the truth. Lord, here we are so removed from the scene by date and by region. Lord, but it is the same scene. It is the same scene that has happened so many times. When sight has been given to the sinner... And faith has been expressed and salvation has been granted to the unbeliever. Lord, I pray that you'd help us. Lord, that we might have our eyes opened by you, the light of the world. Lord, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As we've been going through the book of John, we have seen over and over and over again, Jesus uh, give the truth that he is the light of the world. He has spoken it uh, many different places. He has spoken it and declared it. And they know exactly what he's talking about when he says that he is the light of the world. He is not simply the presence of God in their existence, in their presence. He is God in the present. He is God there in the flesh. He is God, very God. And he has come to deliver the people from their sins. We've watched the scene as there went from unbelief to the fact that he was the light to finally there was recognition. Oh, okay, we, we see by your works, by your activity, by your deeds, we see that, man, you are the light of the world. You are, you are God's presence here. He says, now that you understand that, I've come for a particular purpose. I've come to set you free and you shall be free indeed. And they rebuff him and say, we, we've never been in bondage to any man. We, we don't need to be set free. He said, you, you're in bondage to your sin. And they became so angry with his, with his point of the fact that their deeds did not express uh, of the Father in heaven. Their deeds express of their Father the deeds of the devil. They became so upset that eventually as he proclaims himself again to be God, not just the presence of God, not just the light of the world, not just the, the will of God, but God, very God, the I am, the authority, they took up stones ready to stone him. But they could do nothing. It was not his time, so he passed by. I love those phrases. I can't wait to get to heaven and ask the Lord, what exactly does that mean? Have you ever been surrounded by an angry mob holding stones at you and said, it's not my time. I'll just pass by. <laughs> right? So there's sometimes he was no longer in their midst, you know, or did I, 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 want, I can't wait to, to sit down and say, I, to show me how, exactly how that works and how that happened, because I know you did it and I know you're the Lord. I have no questions, no doubt. I just want to see it. That'd be awesome. 
and he passed by. And as he makes his way out, he sees this blind man. He sees this blind man. Now, don't be confused. The message has not changed. The message has not changed. Can I tell you what the message is? I am the light of the world. I have come to take you from darkness to light. I've come to deliver you from your sins. And there's this overriding message, and this man is going to be an illustration of that message. But not only is he going to be an illustration, ultimately he's going to be a personal participant in the, in the message. And so they find this man passing by, and the disciples ask what it was a common thing, uh, this idea that if, if somebody was born, with some sort of defect, it was as a result of, of his parents' sin or, or, or some, uh, some sin that he would, has committed or would commit. And uh, to be honest, it's not even biblical. You want to study it out, you go to Ezekiel chapter number 18, and the Bible says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Guess who will bear uh, the ultimate judgment for your sin? You will. Okay? You'll, you'll bear the judgment for your sin. And so the disciples asked this question, uh, whose sin? He or his parents. You, you can look it up. You're going to find this is, this is the place where you find somebody born blind given sight. Born blind. And even this man will make that, make that uh, distinction. And he says, who sinned? He or his parents. Obviously, the result of this negativity was because of sin in their mind. And Jesus says, no, no, he didn't sin, or his parents didn't sin. In other words, this blindness are not a result of sin. It's not a punishment for sin. But here's the reason for the blindness. So that God might be glorified in him. Amen. So God might be glorified in him. And you may say, man, that just doesn't seem fair. Hey, listen, I promise you this. You ask the man at the end of the story if he thinks it's fair, he'll know it's fair. It'd be better to be born blind and be introduced to Jesus than live with sight and spend eternity in hell. He said, hey, listen, this is why, that, that I might be glorified. And so what is the purpose for this? What is the reason that he's here? What is the work that Christ has? He is giving a living illustration, a living illustration of he is the light of the world, but he's not simply come to proclaim himself to be light. If you want to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, it is more than just the fact that he is light, it, it, that he is God, that he has come. It is also the fact that you're in darkness. That you're in darkness. It is not a simple acknowledgement of the light that produces salvation. It is also acknowledgement of the condition that we find ourselves in, that we are in need of salvation. And so he has come at this very time. Think about the, the, the foreknowledge and the thoughts of God that this man was born, and he was born blind expressly for the purpose so that he might be at this place at this day so God could be glorified and Christ could be magnified as the God of the universe. You say, man, would God use a person's life just for that person, or for that reason, to bring him glory? Can I remind you that's the only reason we're here? That's the only reason that we're here. And so he says, I, I must do the works of him that sent me. And then he spits in the ground and he makes this uh, mud out of, out of the spittle and the clay and he puts it on his eyes. And there's folks that spend a lot of time talking about that. Why did he do that? And, and I've heard all sorts of things, even from uh, we are clay, and so therefore we are his workmen. And he, he puts himself in us, the Holy Spirit, and, and that unity creates the good works in other people, but they still have to be a part of it and go down to the pool and wash themselves. And, and hey, there's some, there's some application and teaching here, but here's the reason he did it. Okay? The reason that he did it is because he wanted to know the Pharisees that he was not subject to the Sabbath. He was God of the Sabbath. Right. He was God of the Sabbath. They, they make that question very clear. He did, he did what? To, what exactly did he do? He can't be God because he deviated from the Sabbath. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. He is Lord Sabaoth is his name. And so he makes this and he comes back and the blind man is made to see when he washes. And it's a, it's a wonderful thing. We, we think about that. A man who is blind from his birth and the neighbors are in an uproar and, and everybody's all wondering about it. And so eventually they brought him before the Pharisees. And, and be careful before you judge him. Uh, this, is, this is also the proper etiquette that's supposed to take place. You remember when Jesus healed the lepers, what did he go and tell them? Go and show yourself to the priest. To show the legitimacy of that. 
And so there was a particular sacrifice for those that are cleansed of leprosy. And so they bring him before uh, the, the Pharisees and they said, man, this guy was blind, born blind, but now he can see. They begin to ask him questions and they doubt. They're missing the whole point. They're asking how it happened and when it happened. Guess what they're missing? He was blind and now he can see. And they say, now what exactly happened? Tell me when it happened. Tell me where it happened to the point where the man gets exacerbated with it. I've already told you. Were, were you not listening? That to tell you again? I was blind, but now I see. And I tell you, Jesus had an incredible impact on his life. Man, a miraculous impact on his life. Jesus can have a miraculous impact on the life of individuals. It's amazing when you think about that. But there are some things that are, that are important to understand when in the story he's, Christ is illustrating that he is the light of the world. He can take somebody that is blind in darkness and give them light. And then that we see what happens in this course of the events. The Pharisees are discussing it with him. And finally they call his parents in. And they ask his parents, is this your son? Uh, the one that was, that was born blind? And of course they acknowledge it is our son. But, but we don't know. Ask him. Can I tell you how, how, how much religion can mess people up? Religion has the ability for, to sap the excitement away from worshiping God and knowing God. Religion has the ability to sap that excitement away. Now, can I tell you, we don't replace it by just simply being excited. We replace it by knowing, and wor knowing God and worshiping God. To this point, they said, ask him, he's of age, ask him. Why did they say that? The reason they give in scripture is because they feared the Jews, not because of some, uh, they, they, they would kill them or some uh, physical repercussions. He said, because they, they had made it known, the Pharisees had made it known, if anybody confesses him to be Christ, we're gonna kick you out of the synagogue. So rather than be kicked out of the synagogue, his parents go, we, we, don't know what, we don't know what's going on. We don't know what's going on. Can I tell you what's missing? Excitement for the work of God in their family's life. Their son was blind. Their son was blind. And they didn't come in going, this is the greatest thing ever. This is awesome. Son, who did this? Take us to the one that did this. And so we might be his disciples too. They said, well, we don't know. Uh, you're you're going to have to ask him because, you know, we're not, we're not together. Okay? You know, he's a little weird. I mean, yesterday he was blind. Okay? He's a little weird and we're, we're not part of that. I'll tell you, religion has the ability to sap the excitement of worshiping and knowing God. Amen. And so here, I, I, can almost, I can almost sense the, the disappointment in the son when this is what creates this, this uh, exacerbation. He's like, guys, I've already told you. Now, it is true that when we go through this process, the, the Pharisees say, listen, he's not of God. He's a sinner because he did this on the Sabbath. You know what the, the man that was blind says? I don't know if he's a sinner or not. I don't know if he's a sinner or not. All I know is I was blind, and now I see. Now, I'm going to tell you something. There's still yet something missing in his life. There was a great impact on his life, right? There was, a, there was an opening of eyes, just like the folks before saw, and they said, man, we see, but we do not believe. There was an impact on his life. He says, listen, I don't know anything about him. I don't know where he is. I don't know who he is. I just know his name. I don't know if he's a sinner, but this is what I do know. I was blind, but now I see. Now, I'm going to tell you, if the story ended there, it would ultimately be a tragedy. It would be a tragedy. And this tragedy is carried out over and over again uh, throughout history. Can I just remind you of this? God is still having an impact on the life of people. He is still working in the affairs of men. He is still protecting and blessing and helping. And guess who the rain falls upon? The just and the unjust. Man, and, and there's an impact that God has upon this world. But he has the impact not for some temporary temporal relief, but for eternal rescue. 
That's why he has the impact. And so here they had this discussion. He says, I don't know that much. All I know is he's got to be a prophet. You can almost see this, this person's, uh, this individual as he begin to churn it and, 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 and chew on it a little bit. I don't know if he's a sinner or not. He must be a prophet. Listen, he can't be a sinner because God wouldn't listen to a sinful man. And he goes through this process and he finally asks the Pharisees, is this why you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Man, how they, man, you want to talk about, you know, you ever seen one of those cartoons where the top of the head goes off? You know? That's the Pharisees, man. They are so upset. And they cast him out of the synagogue. I, I just find this amazing. The guy that was cast out of the synagogue was the guy that can see. He was blind, but he can now see. Amen. Had his life so impacted by Jesus that he was blind and he can see. And all this story ultimately talks about Jesus illustrating, you're in darkness, I am the light. Let me show it to you. Here's a man that God has ordained to be in darkness. Let me show you light. Let me show you what happens when he sees light. Let me show you the, the progression that he's going to take. Let me show you the turn that's going to happen. Let me show you the difference. When he sees light, guess who he's going to be drawn to? He's going to be drawn unto me. He's not going to be drawn to religion. He's not going to be drawn to self-exaltation. Uh, uh, exalt, he's going to be drawn to me. And here he is cast out of the, of the religion of men, cast out of the synagogue. And here he's going. And guess who finds him? The Bible tells us in verse, look what it says in verse number 35. And Jesus heard that they cast him out. And when he had found him, he said unto him, here, here's why it's not going to be a tragedy. Jesus had such an impact on his life. But after that first impact, Jesus didn't leave him alone. Amen. There was more that, there was another question that had to be asked. There's another question that, that had to be answered by this individual. Not have you been helped. Not have you been fixed. But do you believe in the Son of God? He asked this question in verse number 35. And Jesus, when he had heard him, heard he had cast him out, and he, when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? Can you imagine the answers that could be filled in if the pluralistic religions of the world? Who is he? Well, he's really whoever you want him to be. Who is he? Well, it depends on where you're born. Who is he? Well, it depends on which religion you are. Who is he? Ah, you know, it's whoever you want him to be. Can I tell you? No, no, Jesus didn't say that. He said, it's the one that you see and the one that you speak to. I am the Lord. Do you believe on the Son of God? Now, there is, a, there is an amazing progression that takes place here in the life of this individual. When, when he is first in darkness, he has no hope. He has no ability, and God has an impact on his life. He shows forth his light. Man, he shows forth his light, and he comes in, and the first place that he's brought to is religion. The first place he goes to is to the Pharisees. And the Pharisees says, who is this, and what does he do? What has he done? And can you imagine if he said, listen, I don't know, but here, now that I can see, all I care about is functioning in this religion. So whatever you tell me to do and however you tell me to do it, I just want the synagogue to be happy because now I can see, I can do stuff. But that's not what he was drawn to. The light is not the religion. The light is Jesus Christ. The light, and I, I'll say this, the light is not the church. The light is Christ being reflected through the church. Amen. So as soon as you remove the light, the church has no value. Amen. Has no value. Jesus illustrated this way in the book of Revelation. Each of them were a candlestick. He said, hey, you better adjust what you're doing. You better adjust your doctrine. You better adjust your behavior, lest I come quickly and remove the candlestick. What good is a church without light? When I was growing up, I went to a church. It was actually called Cornerstone Baptist Church. And it was kind of like this, where the, the halls were on the outside. There was no windows in the auditorium. There was no windows in the auditorium. And, 
And I, I went to school there and did some maintenance there. And one day I walked into the auditorium and the lights were off and it was so dark in there. Oh man, it was so dark. But I was just walking through to get something. So I wasn't going to turn the lights on. And as I was walking down the middle aisle, and you're going to think this is weird, but wait till I get to the end of the story. Okay, before you throw me out. I was walking down the middle of the aisle and I was looking up on the stage. And as I did, I saw there was a blue cross about this big, seemingly floating 15 feet above the stage. And I thought, whoa, <laughs> what in the world? And I stepped back and it disappeared. And I stepped forward and there it was again. And I thought, yes, Lord, <laughs> right? I'm like, what in the world, what is this, you know? And I, I was just kind of look and trying to figure it out and trying to, trying to figure, and come to find out that at the back of the auditorium, up above the door, there's a sound booth up there and it had a sliding glass door and that little sliding glass door had been left open just a little bit so that the sun that was outside the church was shining through the stained glass window that was in the front of the church and that light was coming through that small crack and it was reflecting off the cross on top of the Christian flag. And once I figured it out there, I thought, this is awesome. <laughs> you could not believe how many people I brought in there. <laughs> Got them to do whatever I wanted them to do, you know. <laughs> I think the Lord wants you to give me $20. <laughs> if he does, there'll be a blue cross shining in the auditorium. You know? <laughs> Probably not a good idea. <laughs> but I think back on that, and can I tell you what was amazing? Even in that place, the only way the only way that cross could be seen if there's, a, if there's if there was a little bit of light. There has he is the light of the world. And so there had been an impact in this individual's life. He had been greatly impacted. But that wasn't the end of the story. Religion was not the end of the story. Hey, your life may have been impacted. You may have had people that in your family that know God and, and serve God and therefore they've had an impact on you and your life has been different because of them and you might have a testimony because of parents. I'm not where I could have been because of, because of authorities. I've been helped because of church. I've been, I've been blessed and all these things. Hey, praise the Lord for the impact that Christ has had on your life. But when the impact is over, there's still a question that must be answered. Do you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Amen. Do you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? He celebrated the impact, but he did not worship until after he believed. He celebrated, man, you think he celebrated over being blind, now he can see? Yeah, I would have celebrated too. He celebrated it, but after he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, he worshiped, look what it says in verse number 36, he said, and he answered, he said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? Jesus answered, said unto him, thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe and worshiped him. Amen. Listen, a lot of people have their faith. They rest their faith in the impact that God has had on them through people, through churches, the organizations, they rest their faith in, listen, my life is different. Listen, they rest their faith in, I've been helped. They rest their faith in, I've been changed. But that's not what produces salvation. What produces salvation is the Lord Jesus Christ comes to you and says, do you believe on me? Do you put your faith and trust in me? Now, if we were to wonder about that, look at what it says in verse number 39. And Jesus said, for judgment I am come into this world that they which see not might see. And they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which uh, were with him heard these words and said unto him, are we blind also? I would have loved to be there to see the inflection in their voice. Was it, are we blind also? Or are we blind also? I don't know, but I can tell you, it doesn't matter what it is, that God's grace is still available to them. Right. Is what he said, Jesus said to them, if ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, we see, therefore your sin remaineth. I find it amazing. 
that he gets down to the very end of the story and the whole story is going from darkness to light, blind to see. Salvation is available. And here are these Pharisees saying, are we blind too? And his proof of the fact that, they're, that they are blind is because they believe that they can see. They believe they know the answer. They believe salvation is found in another. They believe hope. They, they, they have all the, the reasons for their hope. And he says, listen, the reason that you, that you can't see, the reason that you truly are blind and you're still in your sin, because you're so busy seeing what you see. And if you want to see what I see, you got to become blind first. They're so busy justifying themselves, they'll never be justified. They're so busy exalting themselves, they'll never be exalted. They're, they're so busy saying, I am right with God, that they'll never be right with God. He said, you want to see? You got to be blind first. You got to recognize that you're the guilty one. See, it's so important for us to understand that as Jesus is unfolding the truth of himself, the first truth is he is the light. And as the light, he will have an impact. He will have an impact on this world. But for you to go from darkness to light, you cannot do that until you recognize that you're blind. You, can't, you will not understand to have your sight given to you until first you're blind. I don't know if you've ever gone and had one of those little eye tests done where they put that stuff inside your eyes and uh, they do that and they tell you not to drive and of course we all get in the car and drive, you know. <laughs> and you don't understand what it is to be blind and, and, until they put that thing in. All of a sudden you just can't see right. You just can't see. And it's a blessing when those things clears up and you can see and boy, you're, you're thankful then. You're thankful and you may, I can't imagine being blind. In order for you to understand what it is to go from darkness to life, you have to understand you're in darkness. Say, preacher, are you trying to depress us, telling us we're, we're in darkness? Listen, these are the Pharisees. These are the religious leaders of the day. These are the people that know everything, understand everything, and they have everything wrong. And Jesus says to them, you truly want to see? You got to be blind first. Stop trying to justify yourself and let me justify you. Yeah, but, but God's had an impact on my life. Hey, he's still coming to look for you to ask you the question. Do you believe in the Son of God? Do you believe in the Son of God? I've been, had people tell me before, I have asked them, well, how, how did you get saved? How did you get saved? Well, here's what happened. I had a near-death experience. I had a near-death experience, and God saved my life. And so, obviously, I'm here from a purpose, so now I'm a Christian. Hey, praise the Lord for your near-death experience. No, no. Praise the Lord for the outcome of your near-death experience. But near-death experiences are not salvation. Okay? Oh, my life was horrible, and it was messed up, and, and I had all these problems, and then I just said, you know, God, if you'll fix it, Hey, praise the Lord for, for the difference in your life. But can I tell you, salvation comes through Jesus Christ alone. And when you stand before him, the question will not be, are you fixed? The question will not be, are you alive? The question will be, do you believe on the Son of God, Jesus, who have come to this earth, that he might take away your sins? Amen. Amen. Don't try to justify yourself. Only he can justify. Amen. Only he can justify. You say, do you think that Christians would do that? Do you, do you think, can I tell you? Mm, how do I say this right? Lord, help me say this right. We spend so much time condemning the sinners, we forgot that we were one. Right. Are one. Right. Yeah. So who's justifying who? Listen, the only reason I'll ever taste heaven is because of Jesus Christ. The only reason that I will ever know him is because of what he has done for me. Amen. Is when, when I was down and out, he sought me. And when he found me, he asked me, do you believe in the Son of God? Friend, I, I don't care how long you've been going to church. I don't care about your family. I don't care about your uncle who is a preacher. I don't care about any of that stuff. Here's, what, here's the question that I ask. Has there been a time when Jesus has come through the Holy Spirit and convicted your heart and asked you this question? I am light. 
you are darkness. Do you believe in me? Would you like me to take away your sins? Put your faith in me. He says, if you don't do that, he told these Pharisees, you're still bound. You're still bound in your sin. Doesn't matter your activity. Doesn't matter the impact. You're still bound in your sin until you are personally confronted by the Lord Jesus Christ. And he asks you, do you want me? Do you want me to be your everything? He cannot be your everything until you're willing to be nothing. He cannot be your Lord until you're willing to be servant. He cannot be your God until you recognize yourself as sinner. This beautiful day when this man's sight was given so that he might illustrate Jesus is the light of the world. And here we are at the end. These Pharisees going, certainly that's not me. We're, we're not blind too. I mean, you just don't know what we've done. Can I take you to Matthew? And there will be some that will stand in before him that day and say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not cast out demons in thy name? You know what they're saying? Look at what we have done. Look at the impact that we have had. Look at what we have accomplished. And we did it in your name. Jesus says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. When Jesus came and knocked on their heart and said, would you have me come in and take away your sins? Do you believe in me? They were too busy with their own doing to let him do anything. May Jesus introduce himself to us. He say, preacher, I know him. <laughs> I've been forgiven. Praise the Lord. Me too. Then we should do what the blind man did after he confessed it. We should worship him. Amen. We should worship him. And we have a very confused idea of worship. Worship is not a weekend hobby. That's right. Amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Worship is not a weekend hobby. Worship is a life Amen. of surrender to our Savior and our God. Amen. He is in charge. He is King. He is Lord. We are servants. And we do what the Master says, and when He says it, we worship Him. We worship Him. Yeah, but I don't like what he says. Hey, I'll tell you, in the end, it'll be worth it. Ask this man. Lived a life of blindness just so that he might glorify God. And in the end, it was worth it. Whatever he asked you to do, wherever he asked you to go, it's worth it to worship him, the one who saved you. Let's pray, Lord. I pray that you'd help us. Lord, that you might be magnified in our life, Lord. Lord, maybe there are believers here today. They know. They know that, that, that you've been more than an impact in their life. You have brought them salvation, redemption, forgiveness. They have a home in heaven. You are their God and they are your child. They know this beyond a shadow of a doubt. Lord, I pray that you'd help us that we might extend to you worship. Not the worship just of our words, but the worship of our life. Lord, and maybe we have strayed from that. Maybe we have begun running our life like it is ours instead of the one that you have bought. Lord, I pray that you'd help those believers to come, get on their knees and say, God, I worship you, my Lord and my King, my light. Lord, and maybe there would be some here today, if they were honest, if they died today, they don't know where they'd spend eternity. They may have done stuff, they, their life may be all religious, but if they were to stand before you, and you were to say, why should I let you into heaven? Lord, the answer that they do not have is, on this day you came to me. And I put my faith and trust in you and asked you to forgive my sins. And you became my God and my Lord. Lord, may they be willing to accept you and believe on you today. Lord, whatever the need is, Lord, I pray that you'd help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand